heard of the clash of civilizations? Who's in the clash of civilizations? Who's clashing? According to Samuel Huntington, who wrote an article in Foreign Affairs, it is Islam and the West that are clashing. And you have heard many people over the past few years talk about the need to reorient the whole vision of the world to deal with this reality. And foreign policy and domestic policy and security policy has been changed because of this. In the United States, billions and billions of dollars have gone into new businesses designed to analyze and provide security services to save us from this clash. By the way, if Islam and the West are civilizations in clash, it seems a little odd. The West is a geopolitical category, and Islam is a religious category. So how do they clash? Well, these are a few of the civilizations that Huntington identified as part of the world. Do you know where Mexico is in the civilizations? He wasn't quite sure. He said that certainly Canada, the United States, Europe, they're part of the West, and also Australia and New Zealand. Latin America would have to make a decision about where it wants to fit in in this new world order. When you look at a map of the globe, this category becomes even more strange. When you see how religions, the majority of religions, fall out across the world. Yes, here green is Islam, red is Christianity, uh, blue, is a, blue is Catholic Christianity. So you have a mixture, and then you have, but you have these big blocks of color. Where is Judaism in North America? I don't know. What about Judaism in Israel? Is it the same as it is in the United States or not? So what does it mean? Well, some would say, okay, the idea of a Western civilization in clash with this, an Islamic civilization is a little bit odd because we're dealing with apples and oranges. But there are many who took that idea and said, certainly the two major religions of the world, Christianity and Islam, are in clash. And what I want you to think about today is how you think about religious categories, how they look in your mind. Does the world of religion, and if we take the two religions that constitute together over 55% of the world's population, are they in two blocks like this, with two clear, distinct borders, different colors, different entities that exist in blocks that are in clash? In fact, if we look back it, before nation states were established, and before this idea of a new world order came, most people thought about their religious identity in this way. You could substitute where it says Islam for Christianity. They lived in a world of meaning and symbol that surrounded them. And far off on the horizon, there were some other worlds that they knew about. If they were living in 12th century uh, Northern Africa or the Middle East, they would know that there were many horizons out there. They lived in a multi-religious society, so they knew about them. They were part of their horizon. If they lived in medieval Europe, 10th century, or even in some later times, depending on their level of education, this horizon might push so far that they didn't even realize there were others out there. But it wasn't about equal blocks of civilizations existing in the world. It was the world you lived in with some distant horizons. But there were people within those civilizations who had points of contact. And often it was the points of contact that there were most productive 
for humanity that yielded new ideas, new thoughts, new technologies, new forms of art and communication that lasted and that changed the world and filtered out into different civilizations. This is a picture of medieval Venice, very productive place where the merchants and thinkers and traders of the East met with the merchants and traders and thinkers of the West. And you see them here portrayed in their various gowns and garbs and distinctive dress. I wonder, when I was looking at this picture, I was wondering if the Muslims and the Christians, and there's probably some Jews in this trading environment in Venice, I wonder if all of them looked at all of us today, if they would feel that they were more like each other or they were more like us. So would the Christians in this picture feel that they could identify more with the Christians in this audience than with the Muslims and Jews in that picture? What about the Muslims in that picture? Would they identify more with those Christians and Jews in that picture than they would identify with me? Would they recognize me as a Muslim? Would those Christians recognize you as typically Christian? And if not, what does it say about our conception of these civilizations that have passed through time? That we are part of a continuing line of a religious tradition that we belong to and someone belongs to something else. Well, if we had some mixing up, what is this space where we mix together? What do we call it? Here's a medieval portrait of a Moorish Muslim, an Andalusian Muslim, and an Andalusian Christian jamming, right? So they're both playing their medieval guitars. So what is that? Is this some kind of secular space that they shared and we say, aha, this is where the positive interactions are. This is what we need. We need to get rid of all of those religious differences that cause violence and yes, Muslims contributed something that can benefit. It's this kind of thing. It's passing on the, the medieval oud that became a guitar, the Spanish guitar, and led then on to music, both classical and popular. We need to have this kind of interaction that is secular and positive and uplifting. So we would have a model in which Islam and Christianity and Judaism are in the world like this. We have our own spheres, we have our own spaces, but they're little islands floating up in this sea of neutral space. Neutral space where we could interact, we can leave and walk out of our individuality, of our specificity, of our religious faiths. And as a Muslim, now I can meet you as a Christian or as a Jew in this neutral space. Sounds good, and there are some things about it that are good. But what does that mean? What does it mean that we would lose with this? Well, it might mean that when I walk in the public space that I no longer hear the church bell ringing. And that's true where I live in the United States. Zoning laws, you can't hear a church bell. And I can't hear the sound of the muedden, the Muslim caller to prayer, calling me five times a day to prayer. But I can hear a lot of annoying music I can hear that. And what about our time? What about our sacred time? Our distinguished previous speaker is here on the Sabbath, on a day that is for Jews holy and special and apart and different. To what extent does our creation of a secular space make it very difficult to live that and feel that? We make adjustments, and we can make adjustments for important events or occasions, but do we, if we have to make those adjustments all the time, what have we lost?
people say that we should just get rid of these conflicts, and I know you've already had a debate about religion before, and I'm not going to just talk about religion here, but about the way that I conceive Islam in the world, and maybe it'll help you consider how you think about your relationship with Muslims and Islam and people of other faiths and your own faiths. Now, I was raised to be a person who avoids any vulgarity, so you have to excuse me for this poem. But I put this on because it makes me think about how so often we say, well, let's just get rid of it. Why don't we just get rid of these differences and these divisive things that separate us? There's a poem by Philip Larkin about families in which he said they blank, this is the F word, right, four letter word, they blank you up, your mom and dad. They may not mean to, but they do. They fill you with the faults they had and add some extra just for you. But they were blanked, four letter word, in their turn by fools in old style hats and coats who half the time were soppy stern and half at one another's throats. Men hands on misery to man, it deepens like a coastal shelf. Get out as early as you can and don't have kids yourself. Okay, families can cause problems for us. So let's just stop having families. Let's just stop having children. Religion, faith causes trouble for us. So why don't we just get rid of it? But what do we lose? What I would lose as a Muslim are these sacred spaces. Places where I can go that are not just beautiful. There are many beautiful places, museums, beautiful architecture, but a place that I can go that is devoted to that connection with God. That's what going to a mosque means to me. That's what prayer means to me. That's what being a Muslim means to me. It means losing this sense that knowing as the whirling dervishes who are Muslim mystics demonstrate as they turn that we are on the earth that is turning. This dance is in fact a recognition and acknowledgement that we are on an earth that is turning around the sun and the sun that is turning around in the galaxy. It gives us our place in the universe and that is something that I don't get through science simply. It tells me where my place is. It's beautiful, it's an important place, but I'm not at the center of the universe. It is something that tells me about relationships. We heard about family life and how family life is so degraded now. What does my religion teach me about family life? You might say, aha, I know that's what Islam teaches. Look at that girl. There she is, an oppressed Muslim woman having to wear that thing on her head, as I do. So here's a young man and a young woman, a young married Muslim couple. They happen to be Mexican-American, who are happy and in love. And yes, they have a wonderful relationship. And what does this form of dress do? It means that she's out in public. In public, she can work, be respected, present herself as a respectable, professional adult be judged for her ideas, her book in her hand. She's probably a student. But when she goes home, the scarf comes off, the nice dress comes on, and she is with her husband in the intimacy of their home, having a special, personal, private space. In modern secular society, we don't have that difference. We're the same in the house as outside of the house. So we wonder, what do we do? Do we look, do we bring the sexiness outside? Or do we take it away from the home? The way we live as Muslims is not to oppress women, but to preserve both spaces. To pr preserve the beauty and the intimacy of home life and to be able to be a respected person, not a woman who is judged for her figure, for her look, when she's trying to simply be a member of society. What it does for me is 
give us relationships. This man in this picture is a friend of mine. He used to be a high fashion model. You can see he's very handsome. But he left that to become a religious scholar. He left the life of being judged for how he was outside to develop an inner life, a rich inner life of devotion to God and study of sacred scriptures. Here he is teaching his daughter that, passing it on. So this religious life, this life of studying the Quran, of reading it and reciting it as generations have done, gives him this relationship with his daughter that is unique. It gives us an ethical foundation. It's a wonderful organization in, in Pakistan, the Edi Foundation. You know, you see these two people, and probably from what you see on the news all the time, you say, oh, these are Taliban. These people must be loading this car with explosives. They're going to go blow up the someplace, right? Actually, this is an ambulance. This is an amazing organization that works with the poor throughout Pakistan. They go and they, completely on donations, and donations of many people who are not wealthy, just ordinary people who give a little bit, and many more who give their time, are trying to help in a society that does not have a very well-developed structure. The political situation is not good. It's not effective. There aren't good public services, so they've stepped in, and they've done this, and they have a beautiful program where they leave uh, creches outside of hospitals and other centers that they have to make sure that women who become pregnant and they can't keep their children for whatever reason, that they can leave their children and they can be adopted and loved and cared for. Ordinary Muslims, 99% of Muslims in the world are ordinary good people like this. But when we see men dressed in these uniforms, we think bombers, we think terrorists, and that's a tragedy. Our religious models also need to be shifted because we're not just religious, we're cultural. A Muslim in Mauritania is not the same as a Muslim in Brooklyn, a girl whose family died in a fire in Brooklyn, and here with her community is writing in graffiti and spray paint on the wall a verse of the Quran in English translation saying, to God we belong and to him we return. She's American, she's Muslim. She's very different than these. Same religion, different culture. Chinese Muslim. So maybe our religious model needs to look more like this. There's no white. There are cultures, there are religions. We are mixing together all over the world. But we keep our specificity. None of us are neutral. Some of us are more colored by our religious practice. Some of us are less colored. We're all colored by the cultures that we have. So our model of religious identification needs to change. And Islam fits in this puzzle, in this picture, in this mosaic of humanity across the world. And that's the reality. But we can have problems, a beautiful scene of two boys walking along with their home, their culture, their faith. It can be changed by violence. There is violence. And then anger turned against. And then religion, my religion, becomes a source of strength for revenge, even though it's a political cause. And then the crackdown that doesn't dis uh, discriminate between the innocent and the, un and the guilty, that has a boy, a little boy like this, whose father has been detained by the American troops in Afghanistan, having this experience. And now, what will they do in the future? Will religion be a cause now for them to take strength and revenge against those who did this, or for reconciliation? My view and what I'm doing with my friends who are Muslim leaders from all over the world is saying we have to make it a source of reconciliation when there are political problems, when there's violence. And this is why over, just over a year ago, 
a group of Muslim leaders, 138 Muslim leaders across the world issued an open letter to the Christians of the world saying that Muslims and Christians together make up well over half the world's population. Without peace and justice between these two religious communities, there could be no meaningful peace in the world. The future of the world depends on peace between Muslims and Christians. The basis for this peace and understanding already exists. It is part of the very foundational principles of both faiths, love of the one God and love of neighbor. This letter was received by Christians all over the world an enormous, wonderful reaction. Since then, thousands of Christian leaders from all over the world have accepted this and have implemented this, the common word as the basis for joint action, for social justice, for, for religious reconciliation. I just came here yesterday from Rome where I met with major Muslim leaders, senior Muslim leaders, and Catholic leaders, and then with the Pope who issued a statement in support of this, the Archbishop of Canterbury, American Evangelicals. And we have a similar initiative with Jews. So we can use our religious differences, the specificity of our religion, the faith that makes us want peace and justice to have a different kind of religious identity. And then it can be good for everyone. So I end with this, one of my favorite people, Nobel Peace Prize winner, Muhammad Yunus, the uh, founder of the Grameen Bank, micro lending, who's a Muslim, raised as a devout Muslim, using the idea of the principles in Islamic finance that usury, so unjust interest, is a source of great oppression has used it to benefit people from all over the world, not just his own community, not just Muslims in Bangladesh, but those all over the world. That's something we can do, and it's this time where we can have the meeting together that is the most creative, dynamic, and helpful for all of us. Certainly in the economic sphere, that's what we need. Thank you. No.